Hi, everyone. Doc T here with another episode of the Horses Advocate podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Please like or subscribe and tell others about this podcast. Let's get the word out there about how we can be our horse's advocate, how we can help horses thrive in a human world. I appreciate that a lot. Speaking of which, I'm getting the word out, apparently, because a fellow from Kentucky just sent me this email. I want to read it to you. It says, I assume that your no-grain diet is only for mature, non-pregnant, and non-lactating mares. I'm interested in trying to find a way to use less grain, but it seems impossible with raising thoroughbreds to sell at auction. They would be midgets compared to all the other horses. Do you have any feeding solutions which work for that situation? Also, pregnant and lactating thoroughbred mares can't possibly get by with just hay and pasture unless there is some trick that I don't know about. What a great question. I'm going to uh, see if I can answer that. Uh, and I need to really dig into this. Okay, there are so many parts to it. So let me just go over some of them. Um, brood mares versus just pasture horses versus lactating mares. Every horse has a different nutritional requirement for calories, for fuel to do what's necessary of the horse. Another great example, seeing that we're talking about thoroughbreds, are horses that are running as two, two and a half, three-year-olds as fast as they can from the start to the finish. Or a draft horse that's being taught how to pull a plow and plow the fields. Or a donkey mule that is either one that is being packed to go over mountains. Or a mini who is just a pasture ornament that's there to be a friend to an ancient horse. Every horse has a purpose and a requirement, but also what we have to understand is that every horse also eats the same thing. So just as a reminder, I want you to remember that there's only six things that go in a horse's mouth. One is air, and we're not gonna discuss that because everyone knows that all horses have access to air as much as they want, ad lib, have fun with that. Uh, granted, some air is thinner than others, some more pure than others, but it's not worth discussing here. Same with water. All, have, all horses have access to water. I don't think there's a person out there who believes that horses should not have water. So yeah, there's better quality of water, there's groundwater, there's drain waters, there's stagnant water, I get it. Let's not talk about that. So now we're left with the four other things. They are minerals, sugars, which are also called carbohydrates or saccharides, fats, which are also known as triglycerides, free fatty acids, um, and others, and protein. Those are your four things that we want to talk about. And I don't really want to talk about minerals. The reason I don't want to talk about minerals is they're not used for fuel. And this is the question at the heart. How do we feed these horses the fuel needed to grow properly and not have problems. So minerals, I'm going to assume that the horse is getting them from the pasture they eat, from the Himalayan or Redmond or some sort of salt block that's been mined from the earth. Please do not use the trace mineral red salt blocks that have uh, corn syrup and molasses in them because that's going to add to the sugar content. So stay away from them. So we're just talking about mined salt and the water that they drink that's being pumped out of the ground, loaded with minerals. So we don't have to talk about minerals. That leaves us with three macronutrients, fats, sugars, and proteins that we want to talk about. Of the three, proteins are used for building, for constructing, for growing, for growing muscles, for growing connective tissue, as well as neurotransmitters, as well as, um, what else do I want? Um, the immune system, uh, the integument, the skin, the hooves. Proteins are your number one source for building materials. So that leaves the, the sugars and the fats, and those are your fuels. The sugars and fats can come in all sorts of flavors. For instance, glucose in the form of starch, 
such as what's inside a potato when you eat your French fries. It's pure glucose. Or as far as a horse goes, it's a starch that's inside of all grains and uh, hay and pasture. Whatever a horse, pardon me, whatever a plant makes glucose through photosynthesis, they store it by gluing them together. So it's one glucose glued to another glucose, glued to another, due to, to another, to another, to these long chains of glucose. And that's what we call starch. And every plant on the planet makes that through photosynthesis. And that's how it stores its sugar. That's how it's, and it, that is used for fuel for when the sun goes down and the, and the plant needs that sugar to be converted into something that is structural for them which is what they call a structural carbohydrate. And to do that, they flip every other glucose upside down. So now it's right side up, upside down, right side up, upside down, right side up, upside down. And that is what we call cellulose. So all hay and pasture, all plants the horse eats is basically made up of starch and cellulose, which are both made out of glucose, but put together differently. The important takeaway for that is that all animals, including your horse, can digest starch and turn it into glucose and they can have a sugar molecule. That sugar molecule is gonna go into their metabolism through a certain process. And that process is going to kick out a, a bundle of energy. And that's what they call um, glycolysis, or it could be um, a metabolism through the Krebs cycle and it can be turned into um, ATP and ADP and AMP, and they can blow off uh, some electrons and go through the electron transport chain, which are stored like a battery, and then electrons are used when necessary to fuel or to actually power up what's in there. So you can see in the background, I'm sitting at the Tesla charger. Those of you who've known me for a while know I've driven a Tesla for 300,000 miles, and um, it's the same process. In other words, I'm now loading up the battery with electrons. And when those electrons are asked to be used, they're going to move from the battery or in the cell, the electron transport chain, and they're going to go into uh, the, the, the base of the cell, <laughs> or in this case, the electric motors, and they're going to be converted into some sort of mechanical movement to make the car go down the road. And the electrons that are produced through the Krebs cycle are going to be used to move through uh, some process in the cell to keep it alive. That's it in a nutshell. It really isn't any more complicated than that, although it actually is. <laughs> because we're just talking about glucose now. We can also throw in fructose and other sugars, and they will go, they're going to operate completely differently and still kick out electrons and still power the cell. And fructose, such as in our fruits or our dried fruits, are very good at creating body fat. So if you want your horse to gain a lot of body fat, get them on high fructose foods like spring grass. Spring grass is going to be sweeter. It's going to be loaded with these sugars. And so they eat them and they get fat. This is why our borderline insulin resistant horses will become foundered and why uh, foals that are born in February and March to your thoroughbreds and they're sucking down the milk, and then the mares turn down the fresh green pasture, plus the foal is eating the pasture, they're going to get loads of fructose as well as glucose, and they're going to have this abundant amount of fuel. I want you to keep that in mind and put that off to the side because that's where the problems start, when you have too much glucose being presented as a fuel. But let's go back to the cellulose. When a horse eats cellulose, they cannot digest it. No animal can digest cellulose. So when we have the glucose upside down, glucose, glucose upside down, glucose, the horse sends that to the hindgut where the colon is. And in there are all these bacteria that love to eat fiber, that love to eat cellulose. And they digest it because we can't. The body, the horse cannot digest cellulose. Animals just can't, but their bacteria can. And the bacteria are going to digest that cellulose into fat. And it's actually short chain fatty acid, which are called acetate, pyruvate, or butyrate. And these short chain fatty acids can go into the Krebs cycle 
and they can be burned off and create ATP as well. It's just that they do it more efficiently. They can create a lot more power. Think of yourself on a bicycle that ch changes gears like a 10 speed bicycle. Think of yourself just pumping away on that bicycle, going you know faster and faster and faster to the point where you can't even keep your feet on the pedals. So you reach down and you change the gear over to something where your, your legs are pumping slower but they're creating more power and you pick up speed on the bike. Well, when you move from fructose and glucose and other sugars over to fat, it's like shifting the gears on the bike. So now you're more efficient. So the horse is going to create more energy and it's gonna have a little bit extra time left over because it's not pumping so hard to actually clean up the cells and actually make things happier in there. So that's called hormesis. And I have whole blogs and, and, and podcasts on hormesis. You can get into that in another place. But when your horse is using fat, it's going to actually clean up some of the um, uh, cells that, it, that, is, that are overworked. Okay, so now we have the two fuels, fats and sugars that are going into the cell and creating this energy. Now I wanna take you back a little bit outside of the cell and I want you to look at the whole body of the horse. And there's an equation. And you don't have to be a math major to know that the word equation means that there's an equal sign to it. So if you look at one side of the equal sign and then the other side of the equal sign, the only way it can be equal is if they're the same. And uh, the same doesn't have to look the same. Like one plus four equals two plus three. So you're not even using the same numbers, but the result is five equals five. And, and so it's an equation. So in calories, there's this great debate that's been going on for a long time. Do calories count or don't they count? And the bottom line is, if you believe in the thermodynamics laws, which state that there, you can't create energy, it's neither created nor destroyed, it only changes form, so yes, calories in, calories out, that actually is true. The more calories you put in, the more calories have to be burned and you have the equation. So if we were just a, a simple machine where we poured calories in and we use those calories and poured them out and it was a zero sum game, we'd be fine. The problem is in this equation, you have calories in and then you have this parentheses and they have calories out and another parentheses. And if you're like me and you think back about those days in high school when we were taking uh, math, um, trigonometry especially, and they would put stuff in those parentheses, our eyes would glaze over and we'd say, oh my gosh, this is where the complexication comes. And, 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 and I, I don't want to overwhelm you, but what kind of calories is important? Because if you put in sugar calories that parentheses means that it's going to be used differently than if you put in fat calories or if you put in protein calories, because everything you put in your mouth will have a caloric benefit. In other words, if you put it in a machine that burned it, you can measure how much energy would be produced from that burning, and that's called the calories, right? So if you put in sugar and calories, on the other side is the horse that's using those calories. So let's take the sedentary retired horse that's sitting out there doing nothing. So you put calories in, and let's say you put in uh, 2,000 calories. I'm just picking a number, just it's for the math sake. But the horse only needs 1,000 calories. Then you have to make it equal by putting something in the parentheses. And that parentheses is called storage. So the sugar that comes in if it can't be used, has to be put into storage, either in um, glycogen, which is how all animals store glucose or sugar in muscles and liver, or it's stored as body fat. So if you put in 2000 calories and have nothing else in the parentheses here, then you have on the other side, a thousand calories being burned. And in the parentheses, you're gonna have to put a thousand calories stored. So 2,000 in equals 1,000 plus 1,000, and it's equal. Everything's fine, but you've gained body fat. That's what happens with sugar. 
all sugar in excess becomes body fat. There's a little bit of a caveat there when it comes to growing foals and for lactating mares, which is getting back to this person's question. But let's just understand the basics. The same thing goes with fat. If you put in a lot of calories in fat, let's say half of those 2,000 calories is fat, and the horse still needs only 1,000 calories, then it's going to say, well, where are, the, where, is the, where are those calories coming from? Well, 2,000 calories are coming in half of them is fat and half of them is sugar. Well, if you're insulin resistant, the body's going to take most of that sugar and try and shove it into the glute, into the muscle cell. And because of insulin resistance, it's not going to happen. So that glucose is going to be stored as body fat. But the body fat, now we're having extra fat coming in. And the fat's trying to be used in the in the cell. And the cell actually has some problems with that. But it still uses some of it. And it doesn't need it all because there's a lot more calories in fat than there are in sugar. And so it's going to have some excess fat. And it's going to store that as body fat as well. So now we have still 2,000 in, 1,000 out, plus 1,000 calories are going to be stored. It doesn't matter, actually, in this case, whether it's sugar or fat. It's going to add to body fat because that's the only place we can store excess calories. So if you're eating a lot of fat and no sugar, there's a good chance that you're going to be gaining body fat. Now, if the 2,000 calories coming in is, let's say, a little bit of sugar and a little bit of fat and a lot of protein, that's going to come in and the body is going to say, okay, how are we going to use this? We only need 1,000. Well, it's going to take the 1,000 the from the sugar and from the fat and anything in excess, it's gonna be stored, but in this case, it's not gonna be stored as body fat. It's gonna be used for construction purposes, like building muscle, like building uh, enzymes, skin, hair, hooves, neurotransmitters, immune system, et cetera. And if there's any extra protein that's left over, then the horse is either going to get rid of it or make more muscle because muscle is a good way to store more protein because all muscle is protein. So what happens in the horse world is we're constantly looking at grain, whether we should feed grain or use less grain as this person is asking. Should I'm trying to find use, ways to use less grain, but grain equates to excess body fat. But the caveat is if your horse is growing in other words, if it's a baby becoming a young adult, these have the ability to take all this sugar and all this fat that you're feeding in your grains and completely put into growth. Because why not? We have all these extra calories and we don't need to store it because we're running around and we're growing and we need all this energy and we're consuming it all in ourselves. So we don't become actually fat. It's like adding, um, a fuel to a fire, you allow the horse to grow. And the problem is if we give too much sugar and too much fat to these horses, they're actually going to grow too fast. And when they grow too fast, they kind of skip over the blueprints, the architects, the construction workers kind of make some um, uh, shortcuts. And we end up with diseases such as osteochondrosis desiccans or OCD of horse joints. You have swollen joints, pain, arthritis going up, occurring. You have rapidly growing growth plates, such as epiphysitis. You have contracted tendons, which means the bones are growing way too fast, faster than the tendons are growing. And you have all these developmental orthopedic diseases. So when this uh, person who asked the question saying, I don't want midgets compared to all the other horses, what he's saying is, He's worried that if he doesn't feed enough calories, these horses will not grow as fast and they won't look as good as yearlings. Now, if we take a step further back and say, okay, I'm going to look for a horse that's a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old. Well, they will all catch up genetically. One is going to get there slower, but it's going to look just fine as a two, three, four-year-old. And the other one's going to be there fast, risking uh, lamenesses. 
but will also be ready to race at two, two and a half. So these horses are being fed a lot of grain with a really good trainer's eye on them saying, okay, I'll feed them right up to that point, but I'm not going to feed them so much more that they're going to pop a problem. So good trainers tend to use their hands on the horse and they look and feel for heat. They look for any swelling at the growth plates. They look for any popping of the knees going forward that indicates contracted tendons of the suspensories or the deep digital flexor, or the super digital flexor. They're looking for all these warning signs, but they're flirting with danger. So the paradigm that people have when they have yearlings that they're trying to produce for sale is I want the best looking horse to sell. Whereas the real paradigm should be, I'm trying to produce for you a horse that's going to remain sound and serve its purpose as a racehorse without breaking down. And unfortunately, those two can't always go together. If you overfeed these foals, they will grow too rapidly and they will have these breakdowns occur. Now, also, when we talk about overfeeding a foal, it's not just putting food into the foal's mouth, but the food can also go into the mare's mouth and the mare will convert that fuel and put it into their milk and feed the horse, the foal through their milk. So now we have a foal being fed on really good milk that the mare's producing, so much so that she's actually losing body fat. She's losing condition. She looks horrible. But because everything you're feeding her is going into the into the udder and all that nutrition is going into the foal. And then you put in a creep feed, which is the type of situation where the foal can come in and have as much grain as it wants without having the mare get in there and get that. And now the foal is getting way more calories than he knows what to do with. So the foal, the foal is going to have the excess calories. And instead of being converted into body fat, it's going to be put into rapid growth. And the rapid growth is where you have these developmental orthopedic problems where they break down either as you know yearlings or two-year-olds or as they're racing as three-year-olds, they break down. And this is because very few people are actually looking at the protein requirements. Now, protein requirements are simply based on body size. And the going... Um, thing to remember is that protein should be fed at between one half and one full gram per pound of body weight. Now, I know that's mixing grams, you know, the metric system with pounds, the imperial system. And I get it. If you're into kilograms, fine. I think it's two, um, 1 1.1 to 2.2 milligrams of or grams of protein per kilogram of weight. I think that's what it is. I hope I haven't messed that up because I'm in America and we do everything's all backwards. So <laughs> forgive me, uh, but one and a half to one gram per pound of body weight. So if your horse weighs uh, 1200 pounds, she's a good sized brood mare. Um, and, and that's what her body weight is. She should be getting between one half and one full gram of protein uh, per pound of body weight per day, which is uh, between 600 and, and 1200 grams of protein per day just to meet her needs. And we all know that in older people, and what I'm finding in older horses, is they need more protein because their ability to take the protein that's fed and convert it into anabolic growth, in other words, growth of muscles, requires more protein. So the older the horse is, the more protein you need to feed them. Conversely, on a young horse, they should be getting at least half a gram per pound of body weight. So if you've got a foal that weighs let's just pull a number, 200 pounds, they should be getting 100 grams of, of high quality protein per day. And this is where everyone falls apart because they don't understand what proteins are and how to measure them and where to get them from. So let me put it into a really fine uh, nut, um, what do they call it, a nutshell? Put it in a nutshell. Anyway, I'm making it very simple. There's good quality and high quality protein. Good quality proteins are all your forages, including the haze and pasture. High quality proteins are very limited for horses. They are basically soybean meal, which is your best, most abundant um, 
available high quality protein there is for horses. You know it's good because it's in all your horse feeds. They put it in everywhere. So the good thing about a high quality protein such as soybean meal is they have all 10 of the essential amino acids. These are the 10 amino acids that they must eat. They cannot make them. And if you want a hoof to grow properly, you need to have one of those essential amino acids called methionine in abundance. And you should be moving that up closer to a gram per pound, especially in older horses having a problem with the hooves. So all foals, all horses at some point need their protein. Now, at the risk of turning some of you off that hate math, I'm going to throw up another equation. Equation, remember, has an equal sign with two parts on either side. On one side of the equation is the amount of protein the horse is getting. And on the other side is the amount of protein the horse is using. And ideally, they need to have as much protein coming in as they are using to balance that equation out. That just makes sense. So for most horses, one half to one full gram of protein coming in will take care of all your problems over here on the other side as far as consumption. Now, when we have these foals that are growing and they're turning into yearlings, and you know, yearlings are like teenagers. They got the head in the refrigerator and they're eating everything you give them. Well, the more protein they use, the less use they have, or let me rephrase that, the better off they are in their rapid production because you're feeding them so much sugar in the form of grains to make them look good so they don't look like midgets. You want to make sure that they're getting enough protein. So as they go rapidly, they can have the building materials. Here's an example I give to everybody. If I uh, rolled into your farm with a semi full tractor trailer load of all the lumber you need to build a brand new barn, and right behind them, a busload of uh, workers with hammers ready to go, you would be just ecstatic. This would be great, all right? So the body is the uh, truckload of lumber. They've got the bones, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, the, all the connected tissue you need to build this muscle, this creature, this athlete that you're trying to do. And the workers with the hammers are the exercise program, whether the foals running around the field or you're actually starting to put a saddle on the back and start to train them and leg them up, all right? That's your exercise program. But you're not going to be happy with me when you find that the lumber and the workers don't have any nails. It's the nails that are the uh, proteins. And if you don't have the materials, the, the amino acids to put together what they need, then things are going to fall apart. You're going to get osteochondrosis desiccans. You're going to get rapid growth where they can't put, put all the pieces together because they're crying out for more proteins. Now, as long as they're nursing, they're going to get all these proteins from mom's milk and they're going to do just fine. But it's the weaning time, which is usually around four months of age. These horses are now going on the pasture of the autumn and that autumn pasture starts to become dormant in the winter. So it's mostly cellulose. So these horses go on a high fat diet but unfortunately you give them more grain because you got the yearling sales coming up. So you start loading them up with more grain. So you're giving them more calories. But where is the protein in these guys? If you're not feeding enough protein, then they will grow too rapidly without all the materials they need to make a very good solid structure. So now they start to break down or they don't look right. They may look good for the sales, but you know, the vets are crawling all over these guys, taking radiographs, looking for osteochondrosis, OCD lesions and epiphysitis and you know, growth plates that are closing and all these things. They're trying to, to rule out some of these weaklings and get rid of them or lower their price. And you don't want that. You know, remember the nerves of the, of the throat, of the larynx, uh, all of this, uh, it's all proteins. And you have to have make sure that your horse is getting plenty enough proteins that it can grow properly. Same with your brood mares. They're nursing these folds and all that energy is going right through them and out into the udder, same with the proteins. So let me take you back to that equation. Remember where I said proteins in and proteins out? Here is the problem. Most of us look at the proteins in and we say we're not feeding enough proteins. So that's obvious. That's obvious to everyone. You've got a fence up 
the horse can't migrate, can't get all the plants that it has between Florida and Kentucky or, you know, California or wherever. They're not going to get the variety of plants to get the variety of uh, proteins and amino acids they need to meet all their needs. They are stuck eating what kind of grass you have in there and what kind of hay you're giving them. And it's usually one or two kinds. And you may go ahead and, and test their protein. It comes back crude protein at 12%. Well, what does that mean? Well, I can tell you if it's from a grass or a, a, a legume, it doesn't matter. You cut that number in half. It's 6% actually absorbed protein. And that's where everything starts to fall apart. But then it's worse because when you look at the amino acid profile of that protein, it doesn't have all the amino acids. It's missing some of those 10 essential amino acids. So it doesn't get the amino acids it needs to build the muscles that it needs on the top line or the tendons of suspensories or the hoof or the neurotransmitters or the enzymes or what have you. And we start to get some of these horses, especially if they're not an active horse, if it's a foal that is you know, not going on to racing, but just growing up and running around the field and now is three or four years old and sits there and eats grass all day and it's stuck behind a fence and you only have an acre and never gets to run too much and becomes a sedentary 20-year-old <clears throat> at the university. And what's interesting in these sedentary 20-year-olds at the university, they take muscle biopsies versus their 20-year-old counterparts that are actually active in sports and they can see inside the muscle cell is the accumulation of fat. And I'm not talking about a nice marbled steak where the fat is outside the cells. I'm talking about muscle, the, the fat is inside the muscle cell. And it is the very first indicator that these 20 year olds are heading toward a life of insulin resistance. It's the first sign at that young of age. So yes, you have a yearling, a two year old out there, they're racing they must have the protein to make sure that all their proteins are being met. But remember the equation, I said, they might not be getting as much protein on this end, but on the other side, they're consuming their proteins at a higher rate. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's say you've got a broodmare. She's, let's say 12 years old. She's had five folds, you know, she's raced um, and she's been used. Let's put it that way. And you're feeding her a lot because she seems to be skinny. So you feed her a lot of grain because you want to cover up in fat because her ribs are showing because she keeps popping out these babies. So you start feeding all this grain to them to make them, quote unquote, look good. But what's happening with that excess grain is it's being converted over into body fat. Now, body fat is inflammatory. They just go hand in hand to prove this. All I'm going to do is remind you of all the COVID-19 deaths that occurred. The majority of them were in obese people. In fact, over half of the men under 50 years of age that died of COVID were te technically obese. Fat, when, when you think of a fat cell, it's, an, it's, a, it's a cell in the body that's got some fat in it. But as you get more and more sugar being converted into body fat, there are no more fat cells that are being made. They're actually expanding the fat cells, stuffing it larger and larger with, with free fatty acids. And when that happens, it's no different than if you're in a room with you and me and we're just talking, let's say we're in standing in, in, in your horse stall, 12 by 12, and we're talking. And then you bring some friends in, I bring some friends in, and all of a sudden we have 20 people in the stall. Well, it's getting a little bit uncomfortable, right? Now let's say there's 30, 40, 50, 60 people in there and we're pressing our bodies up against each other and we're very irritated. We are not happy. That's what happens in these fat cells. They start to send uh, out um, cytokines. These are inflammatory cells. And you heard of people dying in COVID from cytokine storms. Well, this is what's happening and the same thing's happening with these horses. And it gets worse because as you start to get insulin resistance, that insulin is going to take every molecule of sugar that's being put into that horse and it's going to sequester it as body fat. So it's going to lower the amount of sugar that's available for the brain. 
Now, the brain loves sugar. It thrives on it. It is the number one consumer of sugar in you and your horse and your dog and all the other animals. It, wherever there's tons of mitochondria, which are the powerhouses inside the cell that consume the fuel and turn that fuel into electrons to the ATP transfer chain thing, those um, those areas are good consumers of glucose. And what's interesting is glucose needs insulin to get into muscle cell. It needs insulin to get into liver cell. It needs insulin to be converted into body fat and driven into a fat cell. And insulin also prevents that fat from coming out of the fat cell. So wherever you have sugar coming in, you're going to have insulin. But sugar, when it comes to the brain, doesn't need insulin. Sugar can go free in the blood, through the blood-brain barrier, into the brain and be used. Unfortunately, when you start to have what's called metabolic syndrome, which insulin resistance is part of, and the release of these inflammatory cytokines and other cells and, and, and molecules like hemocysteine and um, there's others that I can't think of right now. These things trigger inflammation at the blood-brain barrier. And when it does, it starts to peel apart that barrier so it's not a very tight barrier and actually destroys the transport mechanism that brings sugar in. So now sugar is reduced inside the brain. So you're feeding more and more sugar in grain. And yes, the horse is looking better and getting fatter and shines and you sell them. But what's happening is it's causing inflammation at the brain that's preventing the brain from getting its blood or its sugar from the blood. This is the root of all brain diseases in humans. At least that's what the hypothesis is. And a lot of people are, are moving toward that conclusion, including Alzheimer's being type three diabetes, because all brain uh, things, conditions such as dementia um, and um, depression and anxiety and PTSD and delusions and bipolar and schizophrenia and everything else that you might've heard of as a brain disease, all has at a root cause metabolic syndrome and decreased glucose uptake and failing mitochondria because they're not getting enough fuel to operate. Now that's a huge idea. And I know I've jumped from this person's question to the brain of humans, but I know that when horses are removed from this excess sugar, their brain calms down. They actually become willing partners. They become more productive. They're amazing. I get people saying, wow, after two weeks of no grain and no sugar treats, no carrots and no all these other things, no inflammatory ingredients found in all these balancers and extenders, where the horses are just getting uh, ground plants and a solid uh, mind block of salt and water, they say, I discovered a brand new horse. The horse I always knew was there is now present. They can be groomed. They can be girthed. They can be um, clipped. They can go on uh, horse trailers now w willingly. They can uh, now be moved into a canter without bucking. And that's all because the blood brain barrier is starting to become less inflamed. And now they're getting increased blood flow to the brain. So that's really cool. So getting back to these yearlings and two year olds, we want solid, willing partners that are 100% present. And yet we want them to be muscled. We want them to have enough body fat that they look good. And the whole idea is you have to be a pretty good horse trainer or horse owner to understand that every horse is different and you have to use your eye and the knowledge that I gave you in this podcast to say, okay, we're gonna have a minimum amount of, of high quality protein getting into this horse. That's our starting point. Then we're going to add some calories in the form of uh, glucose and fat which is going to be supplied 
in the forage that we feed them. And now we're going to step back and look and see what we've got. And if the foal turning yearling is not exactly right, you can top the tank off with some whole oats cleaned so the outer shells are gone. But you're not going to put in inflammatory ingredients such as wheat middlings, oat hulls, soybean hulls, rice hulls. You're not going to do that. You're not going to put in uh, inflammatory fats, which is any fat from a seed, such as canola, vegetable, um, corn, soybean oils. You're not going to do that. Remember, soybean meals have the outer hulls taken off and the oil extracted. So you're not worried about those things. You're just feeding what's what are the proteins in there or the amino acids. So step one, make sure they all horses, your mares, your brood mares, your foals, your yearlings going to the sale, everyone is getting adequate amounts of high quality protein. Aim for between one half and one full gram of protein per pound of body weight. Just aim for that. Second, make sure the horse is getting enough forage to maintain their body weight. If they're getting too fat on the forage, soak it in water and get the sugars out. If they're not getting, if they're maintaining their weight and they're perfect, great. You're all set. Feed them less hay in the summer and get more pasture if you've got it. And as the pasture wanes into the uh, dormant season and you want to add some more uh, hay to keep them looking good through the winter, that's fine too. And then if you have a foal or racing thoroughbred or a horse that's doing cross country and is not carrying the weight that you want them to, or a thoroughbred that's racing or a broodmare that's being nursed dry, or whatever, then you can add a whole grain. And oats has been the standby for so long. It works so well. There's nothing inflammatory, especially if you feed racehorse oats where the outer uh, hull is gone. If you want to add a little bit of corn, I'm not going to argue. But the whole point is you're using your eye and you're using a formula to get the exact horse that you want. And remember, this horse and that horse are two different horses. This horse can live on air. It's a pony. This horse here needs more work. It needs to be fed more. And there's another catch. There are some horses that are easy keepers and others that are not. And that's usually based on what's in their gut as far as the bacteria goes. And their bacteria are completely different. And you have to remember, you may be feeding this horse named Star, and this horse over here named Buck. But what you're actually feeding is Star's microbiome and Buck's microbiome. And they are going to give you feedback as to what you're doing, not the horse. And here's another catch. Well, it's not a catch. This is kind of cool. The more high quality protein you feed the horse, the more they'll become satiated and will self-limit themselves so they won't overeat. That's one of the things that we know about protein. Protein causes satiation and you don't feel hungry anymore. So you're not looking for that midnight snack or the horse isn't pawing when you come into the barn. Oh, I'm hungry, right? That food anxiety goes away if you're doing it right. So just to close this podcast out and just reiterate one more time what we're talking about. Number one, Make sure your horse is getting high quality protein, which in this case is soybean meal. There are others out there. You can feed pea protein, hemp protein, whey protein, whey protein isolate, uh, which is more expensive. But if you want to be inexpensive, it's going to cost you about 50 cents a day to feed a, a, a full size thoroughbred on soybean meal. All right. And it's everywhere. I've got people in Africa who find it, Australia who find it. So if you can't find it where you live, look a little bit further. Find a farm store that feeds cattle, swine, and poultry. They're going to have soybean meal. It's an ingredient. So you're not looking for a feed. You're looking for an ingredient. So you want to feed high-quality protein first. Second, you want to make sure that they're getting the forage they need, more pasture in the summer, more hay in the winter, and you're going to use your eyeball. You're going to say, is the horse too fat? Does he have laminitis? If that's the case, stoke the hand water to get the, all the sugars out or a lot of the sugars out. 
if they're just holding their weight perfectly, you're doing everything right. You don't have to add anything else. They'll be fine. If the horse is losing weight because they're nursing or they're rapidly growing, you can add a little bit more um, uh, energy or pardon me, I, I hate saying that, more fuel in the form of sugar and fat. And you can do that with either a little bit more hay if they're willing to take it. Or if you have to push come to shove, you can find something like a whole oat or maybe a little bit of corn uh, because they have the same amount of calories per pound. Remember, everyone thinks corn is hot and that's because it's a denser food than oats. But if you weigh them pound for pound, they have the same amount of calories, right? So you can feed just a little bit of that and use your eye. Do it for a week. Do you need to add more? Do it for another week. If it's going too fast, you're starting to see some growth problems, cut them right back, cut them right out. Put the brakes on the growth. And that is how you feed yearlings so they look perfect. And you can say to the person who buys them from you, there's a good chance that I've fed this horse for longevity, for a health span. So when the horse is racing, it's a two, three, and four, and five-year-old. They're solid. They're not breaking down. I hope I've helped you answer this question. Uh, <laughs> I've spent a long time here. And you can see it's nighttime. Uh, <laughs> the sun's gone down. My car is charged, I think. Um, and I'm, uh, hopefully you didn't get bored looking at that, but just listen to me. Um, and I hope that answers your question. I'm going to uh, send this podcast as an answer to you. And I hope this helps. And uh, I hope you become a horse's advocate, a member of the horse's advocate. I hope you all do. Let everybody know this is what we talk about here. We're talking about science and how to be applied to horses uh, through what we know about humans because we have no um, no valid science in horses at all. We just don't have the amount of uh, horses to do the research on. We don't have the money to do it. We don't have the time to do it. Uh, so we're just getting hearsay from people who have vested interests in their business, not in your horse. They want to make sure their business grows. I don't have that. All I want is that your horse becomes healthy. And that's what we do here at the Horses Advocate. Again, I'm so glad that you joined me here. I think it's about bedtime, I'm going to say. So I'm going to sign out. I'm going to get this uh, published and out there as quick as I can. And I look forward to talking with you all tomorrow or next week or whenever. Doc T out. Bye. Hey, everyone. Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also going to help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.